Welcome to Your Child's Brain, a podcast series produced by Kennedy Krieger Institute with assistance from WYPR. I'm Dr. Brad Schlager, pediatric neurologist and president and CEO of Kennedy Krieger Institute. According to the National Organization for Rare Disorders, there are about 7,000 rare diseases, a significant proportion of which involve the developing brain. In the United States, whose population is about 330 million people, each rare disease affects fewer than 200,000. However, in total, These diseases affect an estimated 30 million people nationwide. That's just less than one in 10 people and roughly 300 million people worldwide. Thus, while each rare disease is rare, having a rare disease is relatively common. Since rare diseases are often difficult to diagnose, it can take years to obtain an accurate diagnosis. And even after an accurate diagnosis has been made, Specific treatment remains unavailable for most because fewer than 5% of rare diseases have a treatment approved, for example, by the Food and Drug Administration. As a consequence, rare diseases are often devastating, accounting for roughly a third of deaths in the first year of life. And in addition to the morbidity and mortality, they can be exceedingly costly to patients and their families. So today I'm joined by two of my colleagues at Kennedy Krieger Institute, who are on the front lines of working to find treatments, specifically disease-modifying treatments for rare diseases affecting the developing nervous system. Dr. Ali Fatimi is the Chief Medical Officer at Kennedy Krieger Institute and Director of the Moser Center for Leukodystrophies and an investigator at the Hugo W. Moser Research Institute at Kennedy Krieger. Dr. Fatimi is also Professor of Neurology and Pediatrics at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Dr. Erica Augustine is the Associate Chief Science Officer and the Director of the Clinical Trials Unit at Kennedy Krieger Institute, as well as the Director of the Batten Disease Clinic at Kennedy Krieger. Dr. Augustine is also an Associate Professor of Neurology at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. So welcome, Ali and Erica. And Erica, let's start with you and some definitions. What is a rare or orphan disease? Are these different concepts, rare and orphan? A rare disease is any condition or disorder that affects a small number of people. Sometimes you hear orphan as well. And um, just as you you ask, you know, are they the same thing? Are they, are they different? And we use those words interchangeably. They generally mean the same thing. But orphan likely emerged out of a concept of vulnerability or abandonment or lack of interest when it comes to research or investment in therapy. So sometimes our policies and our laws talk about orphan diseases or orphan drugs, but in reality, we're talking about rare diseases altogether. That that interest issue um, has been a really important one for a long time. Ali, given our focus here at Kennedy Krieger on the developing brain and, and nervous system, How many rare diseases involve the developing brain? That's a very good question, Brad. As you mentioned, there's already at least 7,000 known rare diseases. And uh, on average, there is about a couple hundred that are being discovered every few months. Uh, And we know that somewhere around 4,000 of them at least will develop in some form or shape the nervous system. And so that obviously uh, can involve the brain or the peripheral nerves, or the spinal cord, and many times it involves the developing brain or the developing nervous nervous system and can present anywhere from a child who comes into the clinic with just developmental delay or somebody who comes in with a very specific sort of appearance that we would call a syndrome or somebody who might come in with, with severe epilepsy or autism, where we then identify an underlying sort of uh, rare disease as the, as the root cause for, for these presentations. So what are some of the specific examples, Ali? Uh, so some of the conditions, for example, that, that you might see in, in clinic? Yeah, so when we think about rare diseases we, that, that come to us, Um, primarily we think about things that affect the brain. Um, So uh, for instance, a a very common cause of intellectual disability in girls is a syndrome called Rett syndrome, which is a genetic disease that presents in young girls and uh, they look normal first at birth. And then after the first six to 12 months start losing some skills that they had already gained and often have regression and start having severe seizures 
and have very specific hand wringing movements. That's very sort of typical for that disease. The most common cause of intellectual disability in, in males is fragile X syndrome, which is another genetic disease uh, that affects boys. And, and they usually present with developmental delays and uh, features of autism and can have seizures as well. Another way to think about it is also diseases that are rare diseases that are not primarily affecting a nervous system, um, like sickle cell disease, which is a disorder of the blood cells, of red blood cells. And sickle cell disease affects primarily the blood cells, but we now know that because of the anemia that they have and the, and the deficiency in, in red blood cells, they actually have abnormal brain development and can have significant brain disease. So we can see it from both sides, either primarily a disease that affects the brain or something that affects the entire body or part of the body, but in, indirectly that involves the development of the brain. The kinds of diseases that you just uh, discussed have been mostly genetic or inherited. Can, can rare diseases also be acquired or uh, like the result of an injury or other kind of illness, for example? They certainly can be caused by injuries. They certainly can be what we call acquired. So not something that's inherited or a risk factor present at birth. Things can happen that come about later. Spinal cord injury is an example of that. Sometimes those rare conditions that are acquired might be related to infections or a post-infectious kind of state. Some people will remember something called acute flaccid myelitis that was in the news in recent years during the summers where there were surges in this very uncommon condition. We also see that there are other kinds of factors that might relate to infections. The coronavirus uh, has certainly not been um, rare. But in children, there is a specific kind of condition that occurs, multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MISC for short, and that is rare. It's a rare consequence of the coronavirus pandemic that we've seen. Many people know uh, people who have had brain tumors. Each individual type of brain tumor is considered rare. And I, I mentioned when we were talking about what is a rare disease earlier, that there's a, there's a regional context or each country has its own definitions. But, but that even goes into how diseases occur. So there are some conditions that are very common in some places that might be very rare in others. Malaria comes to mind. Parts of the world where malaria is pretty common. Yet here in the United States, really it's very rare. We see very few people who experience malaria. And there are many other examples like that as well. So when we talk about rare Rarity, does that necessarily translate to severe or, or fatal? Erica, what do you think? And not all rare diseases are, are fatal, but certainly they tend to be serious, severe, chronic illnesses. You mentioned that um, they're a leading cause of childhood deaths, particularly in very young ages. And many rare diseases are associated with shortened lifespan. Uh, but even beyond that, we know that these are conditions that require medical attention and that they often require medical attention over a number of years in a chronic kind of state. So they're really important and significant conditions, even though any one disease affects relatively few people. I mentioned at the outset that, that it's collectively somewhat common to have a rare disease. Can, can you comment further on that? The, the notion that while individual disease, rare diseases are rare, Collectively, it's, it's relatively common. Very common. One in 10 people has a rare disease of, of one sort or another. And I, I do think it's important for us to think about rare diseases both individually and collectively. So the scientific knowledge that we have, the information that we need to know to provide care and to give guidance to patients, that a lot of that has to do with a specific individual disease. But when it comes to what it means to be a person who's impacted by a rare disorder, trying to access care, trying to find expertise and the resources needed, or for a rare disease, the challenges that are faced in trying to create new treatments, collectively, rare diseases share a lot of those same issues and barriers. So we need to look at both the individual and the collective. Ali, can you, can you uh, tell us a story? maybe as a sort of a story about a, a child, uh, maybe a patient that you've interacted with who has an orphan or rare disease, 
who's right now hoping for, for treatment or cure. And the, the kinds of, of problems that um, real life, real world problems that, that that child might have as well as their family. Sure, I can tell you many stories and one of them that comes to mind right away is this uh, little girl who uh, was born as a beautiful appearing baby and developed quite well, learned to sit at six months, learned to crawl at nine months, started walking at one year, started running around. And just around that same time, after an infection, a, a simple sort of viral infection, started uh, becoming more clumsy, running into walls, falling down often, and started complaining about pain. Um, she appeared very tired, she ran out of energy, and it was very hard to pinpoint what was wrong with her because she was so young. So she was evaluated by multiple doctors and multiple specialists and eventually ended up taking pictures taken off her brain and they saw something very abnormal and um, eventually saw a neurologist who, who knew what that could be and did the right genetic testing and pinpointed the diagnosis. Now, the disease that she has, there's not even a point to mention the name because it's less than 100 people that we know of who have it and it's a super rare disease, um, but it's a genetic disease. And at the time there was really nothing known other than how, what is the gene that's involved in this disease and how it can present in some individuals with no therapies and no intervention. So the parents were left quite hopeless and uh, we're searching around and, uh, you know, long story short, about six years ago, um, we started together with them a research program here where um, they initially raised some money um, to, to build an animal model for this disease and model that would mimic this disease. And that would be something that would help us to understand the mechanisms involved in this disease, but at the same time also use it as a test bed to test therapeutics. And so fast forward now, you know, she's a teenager. Um, she has some disability. She has walking challenges and uh, she needs to, to have some support when she walks around. Uh, she's in, in, in high school now and in ninth grade. And we have, meanwhile, developed a, a you know, we've raised together with this family and others millions of dollars to, to start a serious research program on this disease and have now developed what we call gene targeted therapies for this disease that are still in the what we call preclinical stage so still not in patients but being tested in in model systems and we are hoping that we're going to start clinical trials for the next two to three years before we um dive into the discussion about the drug development uh, after you do work on um, sort of the basic science and the animal model development i just want to get back to as you as you told the story, you, you mentioned that there was an infection that was associated with the onset. And I can imagine listening to this, somebody thinking, well, it's a genetic disorder. How, how do you know it's not the infection that caused the problem? So how might that work, Ali? Yeah, that is the, the challenge in genetic diseases often that they masquerade themselves as something that we think is different. And um and, and so it's not uncommon, actually, for many genetic diseases that involve uh, the metabolism in the body, that they will be uh, induced or they will have an exacerbation following an acute illness. And it can be a simple illness like a flu or, you know, a, a urine tract infection or diarrhea that basically results in a metabolic decompensation. And a normal person would be able to tolerate it well. But if you don't have the right set of uh, metabolism, you will start presenting with symptoms. And this was exactly the case here. So, Erica, li listening to uh, Ali describe that the journey that this this uh, young person has been on and how it has led to the development of potential interventions, can can you talk about what's involved in developing a treatment for a rare disease? Maybe explain the steps that are that are taken to get a drug, well, the the precursor to getting to a drug or some kind of intervention, uh, all the way to market for patients. There's so much that's involved, and you know when I hear Ali talk about this this patient, this young girl and her family, uh, they're really on a journey, and for her, that journey is an exceptionally involves an exceptionally rare disease 
where a lot may not be known. So when it comes to therapy development, it really starts with an idea and an idea for a therapy or an intervention that might work. But before you can get to the idea, you need to understand the disease a little bit. And so sometimes in rare diseases, sometimes there's a lot that's known. Um, but sometimes in very, very rare diseases, um, there, there really may not be such knowledge known. And so that first step may not even be the therapeutic idea. It may be some fundamental work in developing, Ali, like you said, animal, animal models in developing better understanding of the disease and what causes it or what we might call mechanisms or pathways that are impacted. And when you have a little bit of that knowledge, you can then look at those pathways and think about ways to fix what might be might have gone astray. And once you have that idea and you have a way to impact that, either with a chemical or with um, attempts at gene correction, you test that in cell models or animal models, you look at what the right dose might be, what the impact might be, a toxicity. And once you have enough information and enough understanding about that therapeutic idea, you then start to see, are you ready? Is it safe enough? Is it a good enough idea to move that into people? Because you really only want to move your best ideas, the ones that you think you have the most reasonable um, risk safety profile into people. And so the FDA gets involved. We engage with the FDA when it comes to thinking about trials in people and the readiness for trials in people. And when we get to those clinical trials, we still have a lot of those same questions. How much of, of a therapy should we give? What's the right dose? What's the right timing? How safe? How effective? How long in terms of effectiveness? These are all the questions that are answered in a series of trials. And again, when you've got enough evidence that this was a great idea with great benefit, then you're able to move on to having an approved therapy. That whole process takes quite some time. It's a complicated process that has a lot of participants, um, people like like the two of you, for example, doing the, the front end work leading to the ideas that could potentially lead to the, the, the kinds of interventions. But Erica, can you take us through who are all of the key players in creating uh, disease modifying interventions for rare disorders? There are a lot of partnerships. Everyone has the potential to play a unique role. Some people play many roles or some entities play many roles. Often uh, in the academic setting, there are real strengths and actually just what Ali was talking about, understanding a disease, building the models, creating the ideas for those therapy interventions, really getting that pretty far forward uh, before moving into testing um, an idea in people to see if that's beneficial. Sometimes in the academic setting, we actually are able to translate from animal work all the way into people, uh, but sometimes we have partners in that. Now, those partners may come from the pharmaceutical industry, they may come from research foundations or other developers as well to be able to move that forward in a way that can be what we call it scaled. So it's one thing to have an idea, it's another thing to create a program that can potentially get an effective treatment to every person who would benefit from it. And so that's where um, there's a real complementary nature of the expertise in academia and that in the pharmaceutical industry. All along the way, patients, families, foundations play a really key role in helping um, to understand what's important, how pressing is the need, what are the kind of symptoms that matter the most? And really making sure that a whole program is designed in a way that makes sense. All of those individuals, along sometimes with the federal government or state government, have the opportunities to support in different ways or to finance in different ways the development of these novel therapies as well. Um, so it really takes a variety of players to move any one idea forward. So uh, Kennedy Krieger ensued. Obviously, we have a research institute, as I mentioned, and uh, we're very much involved in this important uh, direction. So Ali, maybe unpack, how do organizations like ours support the critical research that's necessary for developing interventions for rare diseases? That's a very, again, critical issue to discuss. Uh, so our, our, our institution might be an example as to how, how that can be done. So we, for example, support by starting to actually training professionals 
in rare diseases and raising awareness amongst professionals about rare diseases. That's the very first step that has to be the part of this. Uh, if people don't know what they don't know, uh, they won't be able to even work on it or make the right diagnosis. So it really starts there. And then we have built an infrastructure and this infrastructure is really necessary uh, and Dr. Augustin is probably uh, uh, the most important part of this infrastructure right now, where we actually can provide support for investigators who want to study rare diseases. So that support comes from providing them, you know, opportunities and resources uh, to do basic research, um, like, you know, having equipment and tools and spaces and, and the expertise to, for instance, study uh, stem cells of patients or study animal models and, and conduct research in those in those models. And at the same time, and equally important is to train individuals and provide them support to conduct clinical research. See, part of the problem with rare diseases is because they are rare, we often don't know what the, the severity of the disease can be and what the disease course can be. And so we really need to first, before we go into treating patients with a drug uh, for a trial, we need to know what are we going to be looking out for. And so uh, that that is where understanding the outcome of a disease is really critical and, and building an infrastructure that allows you to use, say, psychological testing or specific quantitative testing like MRIs or motor testing um, is, is really critical to, to sort of uh, conduct this, this type of research. And so these are all uh, infrastructures that have to be built for an institution to be able to conduct rare disease research. You, you both uh, have commented uh, already on funding. Ali, let's, let's talk about why funding is so necessary and what are the, what are the real world barriers for getting the amount of funding that, that is needed to, to make progress? Yeah, so... As I just mentioned, all these things, the infrastructure to conduct this research, this is very expensive. Uh, doing research is very expensive. It costs millions of dollars. If you want to study just basic stem cell mechanisms and how uh, mechanisms are happening in a disease, at the same time, it's also very expensive to conduct clinical research where you have to, have to potentially have patients travel across the country and bring them on site for several days and so on. And so we are we are highly dependent on funding to to do this. It really takes takes an, an infrastructure and a whole village uh, to really move these rare diseases forward. And so therefore we need money. And uh, part of the challenge that we have is because things like the disease that we work on, like I mentioned, Red syndrome and fragile X, for instance, are rare. People are not aware of them, and so it's it, and and so there is a need for advocacy so that we can actually raise awareness so that people understand that this is important, and that's why we need to contribute, and that that's across the board. You know, and, and for example, the National Institute of Health has a very limited budget to study the uh, natural disease courses or what we call natural history in these rare diseases. Uh, they have a very limited budget for that, but that's critical. We can't really do a clinical trial without that. And so we often are highly dependent on foundations and advocacy groups and donations that will fund these type of research, the type of research that's really critical, but is not necessarily uh, given priority by, by, the, by the regular funding agencies. It's a great segue to the, the topic. Actually, Erica already talked a bit about the role of patients and families in, in the research enterprise, but in common disease, people with a common disease don't necessarily have to participate in research because, well, there are many other people who might be able to. But in rare disease, so often patients and their families not only are dealing with the burden of the disease, but also the, the burden of participation. Erica, can you comment more on, on the role that patients and families play in, in this effort? It is a bit different um, than the experience of having a common disease where you walk into any office or you talk with any friend or colleague and they're likely to know or at least have heard of what might be happening with you or within your family. In rare diseases, that's not always the case. That's often not the case. And so one of the, the key contributions, and you know, it may be an unfair responsibility, but is raising awareness. 
uh, raising awareness about the condition, about what it is, being able to help educate and, and point people in the right direction once you're knowledgeable. And then there are many kinds of opportunities to contribute where in small ways and large, that may be answering a survey to participate in research to help understand what's happening with you or with your family member in terms of how the disease unfolds. That may be actually participating in a research study where you go someplace in person or have a virtual visit. You may provide samples or specimens for research or for study. You may help design some of those studies and provide that kind of input. Many families actually help fund research. That's one of the greatest financial investments that can be made is to actually provide seed money to help researchers get started in a new direction or an early career investigator launch a career that's focused on the disease that's of interest to any, again, one foundation or family. So there are really all kinds of ways to contribute all the way through therapy approvals and through policymaking. There are even opportunities at the government level, be it state, or federal um, and with our regulatory bodies to provide input and to be able to provide commentary on major decisions that are made. So everything from making sure that your doctor is informed about your disease if needed, all the way to working with regulatory bodies at the national or even international level and everything in between, there are those opportunities. Yeah, you know, there there have been some recent wins. I've, I've been in trial neurology for um, well, a little bit longer than, than you guys have. And there are some diseases that have had wins that early on I really did not have a lot of optimism for. I guess maybe, uh, Ali, take us through some of those recent wins for rare childhood onset neurological diseases. Yeah, I, I too, uh, I'm not that young anymore. And I think all three of us, in fact, remember very well uh, a disease called spinal muscular atrophy, where it, this was a terrible, deadly condition affecting young children and infants, basically losing all their muscle function and dying of, of respiratory failure after a few months of life. And uh, I, I, I followed several patients in the past who, who, would, who would die of this disease. And um, a few years ago, we got two therapies that are now effective and approved for this disease. Uh, um, one is, uh, they're both gene targeted therapies. One is called anti sense oligonucleotide therapy, and the other one is uh, gene therapy, where we basically bring in the, the deficient gene into the body uh, of, of these children. Another condition I can tell you that was a very recent approval is a disease that I personally have been working on for many years called adrenal leukodystrophy, which was another deadly disease affecting young boys, leading to, to death after symptom onset within a couple of years. And we now have an approved product, again, another gene therapy approach where we sort of fix the, the genetic defect outside the body of these boys and give them back their own cells. So there are many, many trials happening as we speak and and many of these really deadly fatal disorders are becoming treatable uh, as we speak so so there is a lot of optimism there lots of optimism and um it, it is really a different landscape than than really just 10 years ago or so i i but one of the issues that comes with these treatments is that they are costly and erica i, I think a, a straightforward issue is whether the costs for treatment exacerbate disparities that exist in terms of access to care, access to these new treatments. Can you comment on, on your perspective on, on issues around disparities related to th these interventions? This is an area where we don't yet have a lot of data, a lot of concrete knowledge, but we certainly can extrapolate and we can use common sense approaches to thinking about these issues. Extrapolating, we know disparities exist in virtually every aspect of medicine. And so it would be logical to extend that to this context where most issues that we see in medicine are actually exacerbated in the rare disease context because of all of the challenges that we've discussed before. So I certainly expect to see, unfortunately, disparities. And there may be a few different kinds of issues at hand. You mentioned cost. So certainly that is, is one of these issues. New drug approvals for rare diseases, they typically come with a very, very high price tag. Now, generally, 
as we started with, many conditions that are considered rare don't have available effective treatments. So when there is a new therapy approved, it might be a little bit more likely to be covered by insurance or at least partly covered by insurance because it is the option. There isn't a plan B, it is the option and they're typically um, quite effective or often are quite effective. So that is a positive, but that coverage may not extend to all of the wraparound and additional care that is needed or the out-of-pocket costs that come with many visits that sometimes are required for that. So it, even this cost alone is, is one major issue and risk for disparity. But another one is access. So Ali, you talked about a new drug approval that involves taking cells out of the body, modifying them, and then returning them to the person. It's a highly specialized kind of approach. And that's an approach that's not going to be available absolutely everywhere, especially right after an initial approval. So there may be certain centers, certain geographic locations where these therapies are available. And that just, again, is, a, is an access issue, exacerbates known disparities. So there, there really is a lot that we have to learn. There are groups that are working on issues of diagnosis, issues of access. There's a rare disease diversity coalition led by Linda, Linda Goler Blunt um, that is very active and is really trying to address some of these issues, obtain the data and create some of those solutions. Well, uh, we will provide on the, on the page for this uh, podcast episode links to uh, information relevant to these points, to resources to understand more about rare disorders and what we all can do to help uh, advance the um, success and treatment for them. Thank you so much to this month's guests and to our listeners. We hope you have enjoyed this discussion as much as we have and found the information we've shared interesting and helpful. We hope you'll share this podcast with your friends and consider rating it as well. Please check out our entire library of topics on your child's brain at wypr.org, kennedykrieger.org, ypr.org slash studios, or wherever you get your podcasts. You've been listening to Your Child's Brain. Your Child's Brain is produced by Kennedy Krieger Institute with assistance from WYPR and producer Spencer Bryant. Please join us next time as we examine the mysteries of your child's brain.